Clearly, healthcare has been in the news a lot this year, and healthcare has always been important in the United States. At $3.6 trillion, it's 18% of our GDP. The interesting thing about healthcare is that it's different than most other markets as well, though. Um, with all the moving parts that we have with supply chain, regulatory, reimbursement, uh, patient rights, it's very difficult to compare this market to other markets in the industry. It's also difficult to draw a straight line from the patient to the provider uh, to the payer. And in Michael uh, Porter's book, in uh, Redesigning Healthcare, he looks at the fact that healthcare itself uh, is primarily broken around its delivery system. Uh, and that uh, delivery system is challenged in that innovation moves very slowly uh, through the healthcare market as well. Um, and this is particularly acute in uh, rural areas where there's very little competition. And if there is competition, the prevailing thinking is to keep the patient within that system. COVID-19 has laid bare a lot of the challenges within our delivery system. And you have to look no further than the delivery of personal protection equipment and ventilators and medication to make sure that we get to the right place at the right time. Rural healthcare also faces significant challenges. At uh, most rural hospitals are the cornerstone of the community. Uh, they represent uh, prosperity. They are sometimes the largest employer in the community. It's where local families come into and leave this world. And reimbursement has been a real challenge for these rural hospitals in that without the reimbursement uh, being higher, many hospitals have gone out of business. In fact, in the last year, 121 hospitals have closed their doors in these communities. Regardless of the reimbursement issues that we face, there are still patients that need to be taken care of. There are homeless, there are addicted, there are chronic patients that need to be taken care of, and these hospital systems have to find a way to make that happen. Another challenge that is facing rural hospitals is the facing all of healthcare, and that is that there is a predicted 120,000 physician shortfall by the year 2030. So there's a big gap in physicians. And before COVID-19, 50% of physicians were showing signs of burnout. So there's a big challenge there as well. So financially, there's a challenge with rural hospitals. Attracting providers is a challenge for hospitals. Rural hospitals also wanna make sure that they're giving their patients the best care, irrespective of where or when it's received, ensuring that those patients are taken care of. This really increases the administrative cost for the systems uh, and an additional burden for them. They have no choice. Rural hospitals have no choice than to rethink how to go forward from here. Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, really uh, elaborates on how anybody who has a smart device has access to world-class services and world-class support. And hospital systems should look at uh, these programs as a way to move forward. Telehealth is defined differently in every state in the country today. Every single state looks at telehealth differently. It's as simple as an audio phone call between a doctor in a hospital and a patient at home. Two, as complicated as multiple caregivers looking at data that was received on a wireless stethoscope uh, to look at uh, patient uh, progress. We already know that healthcare is a challenge and that innovation moves slowly, but let's look back at what some people have found relative to uh, uh, telehealth. Fast Company did an article on the 1918 Spanish flu. And there was uh, part of that discussion was in 1910, so eight years prior to the uh, Spanish flu, there was a uh, 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 touting uh, telephone as the then current technology to keep people from dissociative disorder, allowing families to communicate with each other even though they may be separated from each other. Tuberculosis at that time was a real challenge and without a vaccine, one in seven families were affected by tuberculosis. So there's a lot of separation. And then the Spanish flu hit in 1918. And there was a New York Times article editorial that was pulled out that was said, uh, please uh, limit the amount of time that you use a telephone because of the fact that our operators are out sick. And a Battle Creek News article 
that said, please use the telephone uh, only for essential business. So how much of this is history repeating itself and how much of it is a challenge that we could learn from? Did dissociative disorder become more rampant because of the fact that we didn't have that delivery system down? So what's new? What can we do now? Let's say you're sitting at home, you're watching television and a message pops up and it says your physician would like to talk with you. You accept the call and it's a video call with your physician and she says that she's concerned about some data that she's seeing and that you, you show signs of increased atrial fibrillation. And you say that you feel a little lightheaded but nothing to be bothered about and uh, she says you really feel that you should come in. She insists on you coming in and asks if you would like your wife to join the call. Obviously you let your wife join the call and the doctor explains that the wearable device that you have is showing increased uh, challenges and that uh, there is a potential for a catastrophic event for you if you don't seek help right away. And that she's already called a trained and certified driver to come pick you up and that that driver would deliver you about the same time that your wife arrives at the hospital. When you arrive at the hospital, your electronic health record is shared with all the patients, all the caregivers who are appropriately allowed to see your uh, EHR. All you have to do is tell them your name and birth date uh, and they allow to progress you through the system. After some tests are done, uh, it is confirmed that uh, you are indeed having a, a problem, uh, but with some modifications uh, to your diet and reduced stress that maybe you could avert a minimally invasive uh, uh, atrial uh, heart uh, ablation. The doctor also prescribes to you some mobile apps to focus on reducing stress, increasing sleep, improved uh, exercise. And so while you're driving home after leaving the doctor's office or the hospital, you know that your medication is gonna be delivered by Amazon within two hours, that you've got mobile apps that you're downloading on the drive home, and you also open a email with your final bill, which is correct and in line with what your expectations were. We are closer now to these kinds of scenarios than we ever have been because of COVID-19. The acceleration that COVID-19 provided in the last couple months is amazing. Uh, they've done, uh, we've done more in the last six weeks than was done in the previous 10, year, previous 10 years relative to telehealth. The patient uh, can be seen across state lines and reimburse, reimbursement is done. This is through the help of Medicare and Medicaid. So prior to COVID-19, you were restricted in how you could be seen and how you could be reimbursed with telehealth. Obviously, the government has done a good job of allowing us to provide care where care is needed. And this was done by eliminating the licensure issue across state lines and allowing reimbursement to be done at exact the same, exactly the same rate, whether it was in person or a virtual visit. During this time, Henry Ford went from 150 visits per week to over 6,000. BCBS and HAP, along with uh, uh, Priority Health, waived copays as well as guaranteeing uh, reimbursement for the payers. UPMC also saw an increase of 250 virtual visits per day to over 9,000, a 3,700% increase in virtual visits in that short amount of time. And what we've learned by that is that many of the visits that we're seeing are for patients who really should stay out of the hospital, those patients who are on chemotherapy, those patients who have uh, heart disease or diabetes. So should we be concerned about what's going on with COVID? Should we be concerned about the healthcare marketplace? And the current environment is potentially catastrophic for a certain uh, part of our community. Um, not to downplay the significant and horrible cost of suicide, but on an annual basis, we have a $1 trillion cost globally to depression. And in the month of March, there was a 34% increase in prescribed anti-anxiety medication. Our providers, our caregivers are doing everything they can to help us out. And our caregivers need help as well. A company called Talkspace has uh, provided uh, free of charge to our caregivers anytime, any place care for them to uh, seek help about their own, uh, their own mental health during this uh, challenging time. And what they've seen is that they've had conversations with these, uh, these service providers that say, we're all in this together. 
uh, you know, the thoughts that you have are global. Everyone has very similar thoughts. And that these thoughts are bad for your immune system, so you're unable to continue to do your job if you don't pay attention to your own health. And that the irrational or destructive thoughts should be mitigated. So Talkspace has done a good job of helping out our caregivers. At the same time, Headspace and Calm have also provided their applications for patients. And patients are able to download this content and use that offline. So if they don't have access to the internet while they're there. In times of uncertainty, what people really need is simple. We need clear, accurate data, and we need to be kept away from misinformation. And that may sound simple, but in this age of the internet, where the democratization of data has become so prevalent, there's so much information about healthcare, it needs to be curated every day. In fact, there's a book that's out by Nir Eyal called Hooked. And what he talks about in his book is how software programmers are actually designing mobile apps that are addictive to people who use them. And we all know what it's like to go back and check and do likes um, and make sure that you've got updates on your social media. That's by design. The software programmers are doing that by design. And that's fine if it's for good. But if it's for nefarious reasons, that's a big challenge. And you can't treat a gamer the same way you treat a patient. Patients need to be treated differently. And so when you, when you look at the way things are programmed and when you look at the applications, patients and providers need to be very careful what applications those patients are using. Interestingly enough, Neri Al published a separate book later on, which is called Indistractable, which shows people how not to be addicted by these applications that are designed. But these apps, when used appropriately and when under the guidance of a physician, are really important and very impactful. There's promise uh, and a bright future for our uh, rural hospital systems. So where can we go? Rahm Emanuel uh, quoted uh, Winston, Winston Churchill, or paraphrased him, and said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what he means by this is, while you're in the midst of a crisis, there are things that you would do that you never thought of doing before. And that's kind of where we are with healthcare in this country today. What if we were to reduce the amount of time physicians spend on their screen and increase the amount of time that they spend with their patients? What would that do to offset the uh, potential shortfall of physicians that we're gonna have in the year 2030? What if we were to find a way to get uh, to the last 25 to 30% of patients uh, broadband so that they can access telehealth? Which by the way, primary care, 80% of primary care can be delivered via telehealth. So what if we were able to provide that? What if we were able to provide patients the seamless type of approach that we talked about in our scenario that drives out cost by from the time the appointment is scheduled until the time they receive their final bill, everything is seamless to the patient. I think we need to immediately embrace one of the most important challenges that are gonna precipitate out of COVID-19, which is our mental health issues, anxiety and depression, hopefully not suicide, but it's going to be a challenge and let's not let history repeat itself. Let's allow the delivery system to make sure that it's as efficient as possible and as accessible as possible. Yes, healthcare is complicated. There's a lot of different things going on within healthcare. And yes, rural hospitals have their own significant challenges. But telehealth is working. We've proven that it can work. Pro uh, providers are using it. Patients are using it. Let's not miss that opportunity to use this modality. And I would say, why not let our rural hospitals lead the way in this endeavor? Thank you very much.